asked myself for many years, what would it look like to have John Caputo engage with the Catholic tradition more concretely? And I was very excited at the opportunity to invite him here. And I'm very grateful um, that you're with us today. As a lot of you, I'm sure, know, John is the Thomas J. Watson Professor of Religion Emeritus at Syracuse University and David Cook Professor of Philosophy Emeritus at Villanova University. I assume if you were another university, they too would have been in the Final Four this year. Um, <laughs> but that's just speculative. Uh, Professor Caputo specializes in continental philosophy of religion, working on approaches to religion and theology in a light of contemporary phenomenology, hermeneutics, and deconstruction, and also the presence in continental philosophy of radical religious and theological motifs, which we've already been discussing a little bit today. I hope we hear more about it. He's known especially for his notions of radical hermeneutics and the weakness of God, and recently has written a, a more autobiographical work which I thought was fantastic, and I'm uh, very, very pleased to welcome you here today. So, if you will, help me to welcome uh, Professor John Caputo. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cody. Uh, uh, I was worried at first when you invited me to do this that what I would say would be a little too far out. What I didn't foresee happening is that in the plenary session before mine, it would be Tom Alfonso. <laughs> so I owe it to Tom for making me look moderate. <laughs> moderate, not modest. This is my sort of, uh, why I cannot say I'm not Catholic. Um, it's, it's, I've been sort of on a migration, you know, or pilgrimage. I, that was the, the image I used in the Hoping Against Hope, a kind of pilgrimage. And as I migrate farther out, I get farther out <laughs> and uh, more heterodox. Um, and so the sense in which I'm, I, I, I self-identify as Catholic was, is, was a good question for me. And, and I uh, was pleased to accept the challenge of the challenge of God because it was also a challenge to say the sense in which I could uh, articulate this in, in the terms that I've inherited, the terms of my tradition. So it goes like this. I'm actually going to read. I don't normally read. I normally extemporize from notes. But I'm going to read this one because I crafted it, uh, and I want to stick to the formulations and, and try to stick to the timelines. Okay, first section, a test case. In the summer of 2015, the Philadelphia newspapers headlined the story that a woman named Margie Winters, the director of religious education at a local Academy, Catholic Academy in Philadelphia, had been fired on the grounds that she was involved in a, openly involved in a lesbian marriage. The word was that this had not been a secret at the Academy, but that some unhappy parents had gone to the Archdiocese and complained, and it forced the hand of the administration, who reluctantly fired her. The reaction against the move was swift and uh, strong because the woman was very much respected and loved at the school. The most interesting reaction took the form of an op-ed published in the Philadelphia newspapers, which was signed by a parent at the academy, uh, a local uh, uh, layperson and philanthropist, uh, and uh, a sister Mary Scullion, who is a well-known Catholic at activist in the city and a member of the Religious Sisters of Mercy that conduct the academy. The signer said, quote, the church's truest integrity is at risk when it emphasizes orthodoxy and doctrine without meaningful engagement with historic realities. After pointing out that the church must take responsibility for quoting again, 
its many historic blind spots, Pre persecution of heretics, oppression of indigenous peoples in the name of mission, and second-class status for women. They then added, we are convinced that this is a moment when insistence on doctrinal adherence is clashing with what we believe the spirit is unfolding in, his, in our history, just as it has in the past with issues like slavery, the rights of women, and environment. Many Christian denominations have listened to the movement of the spirit and moved towards both full inclusion and full embrace of the gifts of our gay and lesbian sisters and brothers. The church is at its best when it listens to the Spirit speaking in our times through human experience. And that response, appealing to the promptings of the Spirit in history unfolding in human experience, seems to me exactly right. A very good piece of Catholic theology had made the local newspapers. Archdiocesan politics aside, this was the right theological argument to make. In my view, the church's position on same-sex love is every bit as wrong as the other historic blind spots to which the letter refers, each one of which eventually succumbed to the pressure of history, or will. <laughs> Time and again, the church in modernity starts out on the wrong side of history. And eventually, several centuries later, catches up with the times and adds a modest apology for standing in the way of science or justice, tucked away in an obscure section of L'Osservatore Romano. <laughs> but the framers of the editorial are not speaking merely of being on the wrong side of history but on the wrong side of the spirit. They speak of the spirit speaking in our times through human experience, of what the spirit is unfolding in human history. So that to discern the spirit of the times is to discern the promptings of the spirit. Their argument presupposes a view of God as the spirit working in history and of the church as the populus dei not the hierarchy, one of the most important pronouncements of Vatican II. The argument is theological, pneumatological, ecclesiological. For the Catholic theologian, it is the promptings of the spirit that rise up in protest against the forces, the violence of history. It's not pure reason that rises up against the violence of history, it's the force of the spirit against colonialization, say, which the church provided with a theological cover with its notorious doctrine of discovery, authorizing the conquistadores to conquer in their lethal land grab in the name of God. In this scene, the church as the spirit imminent in history contests the violence of a church contracted to the official teachings of the hierarchy, which was on the wrong side of both history and spirit. Against the deep errancy and fallibility of church as hierarchy, the unfolding of spirit in history is a movement of auto-correction and reinvention. Against the calcification of dogmatic formulae, which results in simple reproduction, the imminence of the spirit in history unfolds in productive repetition. The case is telling. In its defense, the church might rejoin that there is nothing in the scriptures to authorize same-sex love and that Paul appears to have condemned it. Now, I would deny that what Paul was condemning back in the first century is what we're talking about today. But the larger point is that in the Catholic tradition, it's the tradition that interprets the scriptures. The tradition is the whole church, not just the <coughs> uppermost part. It's the whole body, not just the head, which is a figure that was used by the unknown author of the Sepi 
pseudo-epigraphic collusions, which alters the figure in introduced by Paul himself and turns Jesus into a king or emperor. The tradition is the workings of the spirit in the people of God, and the spirit often finds itself to take a stand against such a heady church. Sola scriptura is the Protestant problem, not ours. Unfortunately, the old theological axiom, ubi spiritus, ibi ecclesia, has a way of being flipped by the foul powers that be in the church, ubi ecclesia, ibi spiritus as if the spirit had written the church a blank check and simply does the bidding of Vatican secretaries. Or the church might have invoked natural law, which would have only made things worse. For one thing, natural law is a stoic doctrine, and to my knowledge, Jesus was not a natural law theorist, in which God is thought in terms of nature and nature in terms of necessity, it presupposes a view of God as a necessary immutable order of nature, Deus sibi natura, as Spinoza said. This completely pagan conception stands opposed to Jewish and Christian tradition, and in particular the prophetic tradition, where God is not thought in terms of nature, but in terms of history. And the God of history is not thought of in terms of necessity, but in terms of making all things new, of the new being of the future, of the transformability of the future. Stoic natural law was the competing alternative to the church in antiquity, where the choice was posed between making oneself commensurable with the inevitable, affirming the necessity of things on the one hand, and affirming the God who will make all things new on the other hand. So apart from the fact that, the natural, that natural law has been the argument of choice for justifying the oppression of just about everything, the poor and the uneducated, women, children, people of color, animals, and the environment, it's a completely pagan argument, pitted against the god of history and renewal, against the god of spirit. So what happened in the Margie Winters case? How did the appeal of the spirit fare before the powers that be downtown in the archdiocese and offices? Well, you, you may have been able to guess, but uh, I will leave what little suspense is involved in that question to the end. I'll, I'll, I'll come back to it at the end. Depending on how much you know about, the, the amount of suspense in that question is directly proportional to the amount of knowledge you have of uh, uh, Archdiocese and offices. <laughs> <laughs> Two, the Catholic principle. The contemporary debate, debate about same sex love also makes plain that one has a much easier time addressing such problems if one does not have to deal with the doctrine of sola scriptura. Even so, the irony is that the Protestant denominations are way ahead of the Catholics in affirming the dignity of women, same-sex love, and the priesthood of the people. But that is only because the Catholic hierarchy is so adept at snatching defeat from the jaws of victory. <laughs> the underlying theological presuppositions are all on the Catholic side. The old debate between Protestants and Catholics is settled even before it gets off the ground. The Protestant notion of sola scriptura represents a misunderstanding on every level. It is based on a factual misunderstanding of the history of the composition of the scriptures, as if they represent eyewitness journalistic reports, on a theoretical misunderstanding of the nature of a written text, which is why it has produced the bizarre result of biblical inerrantism by which, believe it or not, we are still beset today. And finally, on the it's based on a theological misunderstanding of the spirit, as if the workings of the spirit could be contracted to and measured by a book, which is at least as much of a mistake as thinking it can be confined to the upper one-tenth one of one percent that make up the Catholic hierarchy. 
The scriptures are not the foundation of the tradition. They are an effect of the tradition. They were produced by the tradition. When, at a certain point in time, the earliest followers of the way, we didn't even have the word Christianity at that point, decided they had better start writing things down. Chronologically, the scriptures are a relatively late formation. The fact that the various communities chose to write down the sayings and stories that had been orally transmitted, the tradition up to that point, tells us that a great deal of time had been spent waiting for the return of Jesus, and the conviction had set in that it might very well prove to be quite a long time. Their importance is not chronological, as if they are the beginning, and they are reporting back to us latecomers, but chirological. Their composition was the right thing to do at the right time. Right for what? Right for the tradition, for the history of the people of God, in order to allow it to be preserved and transmitted. They serve the life of the tradition. Indeed, they are the tradition at work preserving itself. The scriptures are a gift, but they are the gift of a tradition, of the operations of memory and expectation that define a tradition. And a tradition is an ongoing process of auto-correction. The scriptures do not compete with tradition as an opposing principle. They insert themselves within tradition. They are the tradition in up to exertion. They are still more evidence that tradition is first, last, and always. If the works of Thomas Aquinas were placed on the high altar of the opening mass of Vatican I, they would have been well advised to put a good account of tradition, like Gardner's Truth and Method, on the high altar of Vatican II. It had just come out. It was, it was, there, it was available. <laughs> but do not misunderstand me. While I am pressing the case for tradition, I have not come to engage in a bit of theological braggadocio, to offer a chauvinistic reassurance of the superiority of Catholicism over Protestantism, each of which, I think, has come up with its own way to give the spirit in the world a good deal of grief. As we can see from my opening test case, the results of pressing the case for the tradition cause considerable discomfort to the powers that be on both sides of that divide, not only for the hapless defenders of biblical inerrancy, but also for the hapless def defenders of hierarchical inerrancy. For inerrancy of any sort, the very idea of which drives a, state, a Cartesian stake into the heart of any living tradition, Christian or otherwise, under the pressure of history, that is, of the spirit in history, I think the fifth volume of the collected works of Hans Kuhn will eventually prove to, to be the right response to infallibility. Hence, in a show of ecumenism, and to prove that I have nothing provincial and merely denominational in mind, I want to now turn to what Paul Tillich called the Protestant principle. By this, Tillich did not mean the myopic principles of sola fide or sola scriptura. Any list of such sole would need to be extended indefinitely, and any such solitude would end up being very much disturbed. He meant an axiom which, while inspired by historical Protestantism, makes both a wider sweep and a deeper cut and indeed submits the historical Protestant churches to its judgment. This principle is a function of a prior distinction Tillich makes between the conditional and the unconditional. By the unconditional, he means, on, on the object side, let's say, some substantive matter, let's say in German, eine Sache, a thing that matters, something that lays claim to us unconditionally, without compromise, leaving no room to negotiate the terms of the deal, no way to talk it down. On the subject side, the unconditional means what we affirm unconditionally, what matters to us unconditionally. This is a matter for which we are willing to live or die, as a very youthful Kierkegaard said in his journals, a matter of ultimate concern, 
tell it said. An English word that would have translated the German Zorga, which is the being of Dasein and being in time, a book Tillich knew very well. This issue is in Tillich's famous description of religion in terms of being seized by a matter of ultimate concern. A definition remarkable for its failure to mention incense, candles, clergy, hierarchy, and dogmas. That's okay. I like that. Accordingly, the enlarged Protestant principle is reconfigured as follows. First, semper reformanda, which Tillich explains by saying that the church must live in the permanent state of protest, a permanent self-critique, on the grounds that the historical church is a conditioned response to an unconditional demand. Accordingly, the demands placed upon the church, be it Roman, Protestant, or Orthodox, are never met, structurally, in principle. Secondly, justus is et peccatum. Human subjects are always on the short end of the unconditional stick, always falling short of what is demanded of us, so that we are put in the accusative, as Levinas says. Guilty, called out by something for which we are never the match, always falling short, structurally, in principle. But we are saved, justus, by confessing just how short we fall. Saved by this loss, saved not exactly by faith, but by doubt. By doubt-filled faith, or faith-filled doubt, in something that is seized as unconditional. Till it presupposes an idea of God as the unconditional, as something whose least limiting description is the ground of being. For our purposes, Tillich challenges, I'm sorry, presupposes the challenge of God in terms of the challenge of the unconditional. Tillich opposes the Protestant principle to what he calls the Catholic substance. By substance, he does not mean the substantia of Greco medieval metaphysical theology, which shows up in the Catholic theology of transubstantiation. He does not need the natural law of tradition, which he considered to be pagan and necessitarian. By substance, he means the historical faith that has been handed down through the ages, the Christian legacy. He does not mean substantia, natura, or essentia. He means history. The inherited historical tradition, the theology and sacraments and liturgies that have been handed down, which stand in need of constant critique. The substance can only be passed down by passing under the principle of protest. There are not two different principles, one Protestant and one Catholic, but one principle and a substance, a form and a substance. The Catholic substance is the tradition, the historically transmitted faith, upon which the Protestant principle is the critical reflection. So it's significant that Tillich does not speak of a Catholic principle. It is as if there is a kind of pre-reflective, pre-critical naivete in the substance, which does not rise to the level of a reflective principle of protest and criticism. I think Tillich is mistaken about that. The substance is the tradition, and the tradition is the promptings of the spirit in history. And that implies, if not a reflective critical operation, another, let us say, autocorrective operation, one embedded in history, which we see, which we see when we speak of the force of history, or of being on the right side of history. That does indeed re represent a principle, a principle of historical process. The stirrings of the unconditional always take place under historical conditions. 
Just as Luther said that the Bible interprets itself, meaning the dialectic between whole and part, so does the tradition interpret itself by the ongoing process of self-correction and reinvention, which, being a work of history, is far from inerrant. So there is a Catholic principle, which is the historical principle, which is the hermeneutical principle. Indeed, the neglect of the historical hermeneutical principle is lethal on both sides. It leads Protestantism astray into an ahistorical biblical inerrantism, even as it leads Catholicism astray into an ahistorical doctrine of infallibility which confers unconditional status on a conditional historical doctrinal formulation. A pope or a paper pope? An inerrant book or an inerrant institution? Pick your poison, pick your idolatry. Like Tilly, let us say that while taking this point of departure from historical Catholicism, the Catholic principle is not restricted to denominational Catholicism, but indeed submits both historical Catholicism and historical Protestantism under its judgment. I want now to propose that the opposite of the Catholic principle in this wider and deeper sense is not the historical reformation, but more importantly, the Gnostic principle. It is the decision made early on in the church to insist that Jesus was a man of flesh and blood, an historical agent, datable and locatable. He was a Jewish, Galilean peasant, a healer and an exorcist who lived in the first century and was crucified during the reign of Tiberius. He was not a phantom or apparition of a pure spirit. The Catholic principle appropriately broadened and deepened is the principle of historicality and temporality, of materiality and carnality. It is, the wider, it is wider and deeper than the words of scripture or the datable, locatable declarations of the hierarchy. It is polyvalent, polymorphic, polyglottal. It is the very zakha of Christianity, which is the spirit of the world. And, like it or not, the Protestant principle of protest and critique has been at work in it all along. It has always and already, semper, stood in need of being reformed. And it has always and already been reforming, reconfiguring, for better and for worse. Under the historical, temporal, cardinal, material pressure exerted by the spirit in the world. The hermeneutical principle understands the challenge of God as an opening to the future where the past gives us the carriage for the future, where we have a hope in the future because we have hope in the past. Tillich called this the carriage to be. Let us simply add the carriage for what may be, not etle, but pute, which is the way I would like to speak of what is otherwise than being. It's kind of sounds that my, my, my version of Marion's uh, uh, otherwise than being. Song. Third point, radicalizing the Catholic principle. Now, what one thing we learned this morning was that when Tom Althauser says radical, he means uh, uh, extreme, far out of the mainstream, uh, against the grain. It's not what I mean. Uh, work, classically, the word means, you know, it's the fundamentum concusum. That means getting back down to the foundations. Now, I don't mean that either. I mean getting back down to the foundations and finding that the foundations are trembling. So, getting down to grounds but finding that the grounds are groundless. So thinking something radically is to understand in a radical way its contingency and revisability and transformability, not its foundational character. 
So it's, it's radical provisionality. There's, there's nothing deep, firm, and unshakable holding it up. That's what I mean by radical. Radicalizing the Catholic principle means radicalizing hermeneutics. Interpretation goes all the way down to the roots, radics. There are no uninterpreted facts of the matter. Underlying an interpretation is not a pure fact, but another interpretation, no less datable and locatable. The hermeneutical principle is a principle because it has critical reformative force, exciting an ongoing process of reformation, transformation, auto-reformation, tradition, transmission, transformation, transfiguration. Whether we like it or not, the tradition alters under our feet. Whether we resist these changes like the conservatives or embrace them like the progressives. According to the Catholic historical hermeneutical principle, every historical event is a conditioned expression of the unconditional spirit in history. It is, in fact, disingenuous to speak of the tradition or the church, because upon closer inspection, history discloses to us multiple traditions and multiple churches. When we cluster together in a kind of grand, which we cluster together in a kind of grand intellectual shorthand when we speak of them in the singular, the best way to deconstruct something is to write a meticulous history of it. The radical hermeneutical point can be summarized by saying that a tradition does not have a meaning or an essence, it has a history. The substance of the Catholic principle is not an essentia, a natura, or a substantia. It is hermeneutical and historical. If we ask, what is the meaning or the essence of the church, the answer is, we cannot say. It hasn't ended yet. We can only speak of the meaning, essence, or definition of things that were never alive to begin with, like a triangle, or are dead and gone, like a, like a dead language. Then we are free to compile a list of all of its uses without fear that someone will come along and coin a new metaphor, create a new genre, change the language game, initiate a paradigm shift, and cause a shift that reverberates throughout the system and alters its course. The church, like any tradition, does not have a history. It is a history. It is a movement of the spirit through specific motifs and stories, specific beliefs and practices through time. As such, it is, just as it likes to say, a pilgrim church. The church is an historical and conditioned response to something that calls to us unconditionally, which I will call the memory and the promise of Jesus, or rather, as I prefer to say, of Yeshua, using his ancient Aramaic name. This defamiliarization relieves us of some of the baggage of a name that has been freighted, overwrought, and overdetermined with dogmas and violence. It serves to remind us of a man of flesh and blood, to remind us of his carnality and materiality, temporality and historicality, which are the signature marks of the Catholic principle. The worst of all the heresies, the one that is as wrong as this wrong can be, in general I don't talk like this because I like heresies because they make the, they make the powers of being nervous. The worst of the heresies is docetism, the genuinely damnable idea in this history is that the body of Jesus is a phantom, an appearance, that he only appeared to be a man, appeared to suffer, appeared to die, while in reality he was a spirit. I'm not opposing Gnostic metaphysics with materialistic metaphysics, I'm opposing metaphysics especially the opposing metaphysics of matter and spirit. In this place, I think in terms of a theopoetics of call and response. And I'm getting out of the discourse of essence, existence, spirit, matter, 
think in terms of history, event, call, response, where the operative framework is hermeneutical, not metaphysical. In those terms, the, ch the church is a concrete and conditioned response, an historical response, made under the contingent conditions of space and time to an unconditional call, to something that has seized us unconditionally that's going on in this name of Yeshua. Fourth part, the kingdom of God. The name of Yeshua is not the name of an essence, but of an event. Consequently, the challenge of God, for anyone who belongs to this tradition, who has confidence in this tradition, is keyed in a special way to Yeshua, to what he said and did, to his life and death, which, to use the language of the unknown author to the letter, of the letter to the Colossians, serves as an icon of God. As we've all learned from Jean-Luc Marion, an icon is to be distinguished from an idol because an idol traps us with its glitter. While an icon, an idol traps us with its glitter, an icon yields to an excess, draws us beyond itself and leaves us pointing, leads us pointing in the direction of something to which it points, leaving us in the accusative. An icon is something conditional. It exists in space and time. It is subject to the constraints of history of its concrete hermeneutical situation. But it comes about in response to the call of something unconditional, something that calls, something that gets itself called, something that challenges us. The challenge of God is the challenge God poses to us that puts us on the spot, puts us in the accusative. The challenge of God is unconditional. It is the challenge of the unconditional which breaks in on us under contingent historical circumstances. As an icon, Yeshua is a bit of space and time where the challenge of God breaks in or breaks out, where the space-time continuum of history is bent or curved by the event that is breaking in or breaking out under his name. The challenge of God, which is distinctly defined and vividly embodied by Yeshua, can be felt when Mark has Yeshua announce his mission by saying that he comes to bring the gospel of God, he says. The good news of God, the Evangelium to Theu. He announces that the kairos has been fulfilled, which means that the kingdom of God, the Basileia, is near. That we should have a new heart, metanoid, and put our trust, pistis, in the good news. So the gospel of Mark is the gospel of Yeshua the Anointed. But the gospel of Yeshua is the gospel of God, which I think we can take as both a subject and an object of genitive. So we have a multi-layered icon, a complex, multiplex event, an event coming from an, a community, carried by the memory of the community, later on emphasized under the name Mark, transcribing a memory handed down by an oral tradition about Yeshua, who in turn announces the kingdom of God, which is itself an icon or emblem of God. Everything Yeshua says about God is tied to this expression. The kingdom of God, which means what life would be like if God ruled, not the world. If God ruled, not Caesar. If so, the challenge of God in what Yeshua said was challenging indeed. And first and foremost, it was a challenge to Rome. The expression appears to be almost ironic, since Yeshua was and lived among the humblest of people. And the irony did not go unnoticed, and it caused a disturbance among the people who run the kingdom, the real one, the Imperium Romanum. We can surmise that Yeshua had a silver tongue, which very likely contributed to his demise at the hands of Romans. It would not have been beyond him to get in the face of the Romans, but posing a threatening possibility to them, the threat of an alternative to Caesar, that the day was near at hand when the rule of the God of the Jews would be established. When Luke has Yeshua announce his ministry, he uses a citation from Isaiah. Yeshua has been anointed, he's the Christos, to bring good news to the poor, to announce to the prisoners that they will be released, 
to the blind that they will recover their sight, to the oppressed that they will go free, and to proclaim, proclaim the rule of the Jubilee, the year that follows seven times seven, in which all debts are forgiven and the people are able to make a new start, a new beginning. That is how it will look when God rules, not Caesar. You will notice the materiality and the carnality of the list, the poor, the imprisoned, the blind, the oppressed, which is pretty much the same list we find in Matthew 25. So when we press Yeshua about God, he deflects us to the kingdom of God. And when we press him about the kingdom of God, he deflects us, our attention again, to things like leaven, dinner's parties, treasures buried in the field. So there's a constant deflection from God to the kingdom, from the kingdom to mustard seeds, mustard seeds not metaphysics. While Matthew has Yeshua speak more of the kingdom of God, probably out of respect for the name of God, the kingdom of God described by Yeshua seems very terrestrial. And while James Joyce speaks of Yeshua as a heaven man, Yeshua seems to be very much an earth man. That is as it should be, according to the Catholic principle, which is the principle of carnality, materiality, terrestriality, as opposed to the Gnostic principle which is heavenly, spiritualistic, otherworldly. Did the kingdom come as Yeshua said it would? Not at all. The challenging thing is that the opposite happened. Yeshua lost in Rome won. Pilate put down this alternative kingdom swiftly and violently. Rome's rule was as firm as ever. So Yeshua's discourse was at best prophetic. Instead of describing a fact of the matter or predicting the future course of events, Yeshua was offering us a hope, making us a promise. This is what God means. Which means, this is what God means to do. It would be, this is what things would look like. Our challenge is not to put our confidence, pistis, I'm sorry, our challenge is to put our confidence, pistis, in that promise. Even if it does not happen, the future is better even when it is not, which is why it is our hope and why we have confidence in God. This, I think, is exactly the challenge faced by Paul. It all ended in death for Yeshua, and not just death, but execution, and not just execution, but a literally excruciating and, in an honor-shame society, a particularly in ignominious execution, one that left no doubt about who was ruling. The kingdom was not near, not yet, not now. That was certainly what Paul had concluded <coughs> for the longest time, until he didn't. Until one day, or as is more likely over the course of many days and weeks and months, it hid him. He had a breakthrough. In the only first-hand account we have of this event, in his own words, not the romanticized account written many decades later in Acts, no road to Damascus, no voices, no unhorsing, for which we can thank the imagination of the Renaissance painter Tintoretto. He describes an insight, an apocalypsis, a flash of intuition that God had to the utter consternation of the world, of Romans and Greeks and Jews, revealed himself in the defeat, the ignominy and the humiliation of the cru crucifixion bore, in fact, the mark of God, which was the challenge contradiction of everything that anyone in antiquity had ever meant by God, including the Jews. The mark of the divine is upon the defeat and the shame. The challenge of God for Paul is to swallow that, to accept that unlike the gods of the nations who triumph over their enemies, the divinity of the God of Israel is attested 
in the humiliating defeat of God's anointed. There could hardly be a greater challenge than that, a greater challenge to our expectations about what we think God is supposed to be. Paul brings his insight to a head in the first chapter of 1 Corinthians, in which the logic of this wrenching reversal of our expectations is identified in what is, for my money, the most brilliant and explosive account of God, of the challenge posed by God to be found in the New Testament. There he speaks of the logos of the cross, of the shame and humiliation of the death and the defeat, which confounded the Greeks who wanted Sophia, and the Jews, us Jews. Now, it's not the Gospel of John where the Jews are somebody else other than Jesus. Us Jews, us. Paul, Jesus, us. Confounded the Greeks who wanted Sophia and the Jews, us Jews, including Paul himself, lest we think anachronistically that there were any Christians around who opposed to the Jews who wanted signs and miracles. Paul puts the challenge of God in the most pointed terms possible. He tells the Christians at Corinth that God has made the wisdom of this world foolish that God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, God's weakness is stronger than human strength, and surprisingly, God has chosen them, those at Corinth, who put their trust in God's anointed, those who are not well-born, not well-educated, not well-off. Indeed, he says that God has chosen ta meanta, John Luke was talking about yesterday, the nothings and the nobodies of the world, invoking the very language of being that would have been treasured by the lovers of wisdom, Greek wisdom, at Corinth, to confound the powers that be, the people of substance, of usia, who think they are something, who think they are somebody. If Yeshua is the icon of what we know about God, the challenge of God is to see God in the poor and the oppressed, the hungry and the imprisoned, who await the year of the Jubilee in the Synoptics. To see God in foolishness, weakness, and, no and nothingness, in, de in death and humiliation in Paul. Of course, this is all in keeping with the promise posed by Yeshua's announcement of his ministry. It is not an act of sadomasochistic identification with pain and suffering and not a simple rejection of every sense of wisdom and strength. So in the second chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul promises the Corinthians that God's day is coming. That the rulers of this world will come to rue the day that they didn't listen to Paul. That God will show their worldly wisdom to be foolish and their worldly strength to be weak. That their real power and wisdom belongs to God. That's the apocalyptic side of Paul's apocalypsis. But what happened? Same thing. The Romans killed Paul. And shortly thereafter leveled the temple, and the people of God were dispersed. Of course, we might be saying three centuries later, God's kingdom was finally established by Constantine. But for a lot of us, not just Stanley Hauerwas, this was less a matter of, Roman, of the Roman Imperium converting to Christianity and more a matter of Christianity converting to the Roman Imperium. This was rather more a betrayal of the kingdom than its fulfillment, and it provided the basis of what we today call the Roman Church. Can you imagine the effect such a phrase would have had on Yeshua? Could any word have struck more fear in his heart? So Yeshua was proven wrong, and so was Paul. The establishment of the rule of God was not near. The rule of God continued even when Christians sat on the throne. And it would be very hard to say that over the centuries, anything very much like it has ever come about. What Paul called the powers and the principalities, and what we call the evil ones, the greedy, the hateful, the malevolent, continue to do evil and give away with it and the good continue to do good and to be persecuted for it. As biblical historian James L. Kugel once said, the track record of God in, in history in intervening on behalf of the good 
and rectifying evil is so bad that we wonder why the theologians keep bringing it up. <laughs> Last session, the challenge of God. As you have no doubt guessed, Margie Winters did not get her job back. The appeal of the spirit fell, death, fell on deaf ears down at the archdiocese and offices. Although President Obama did invite her to the papal reception at the White House in September of 2015. Still, the kingdom comes in the loss, in the defeat, in the powerlessness, which rises up in dignity against the powers and the principalities, against embodied in the archdiocese and offices. That's the challenge the same challenge Paul faced. The kingdom comes whenever people like Margie Winters and Sister Mary Scullion and their colleagues speak out on behalf of the spirit enfolding in our time and of listening to the spirit acting in uh, our times and in human experiences, which is a felicitous way to formulate the Catholic principle, and lose. It's an old story. When the people of God speak out, as these people did, they risked being hauled before the power of Caesar or the power of the church. Like Yeshua, brought before Pontius Pilate. The comparison is as apt as it is ironic. The people who express the promptings of the spirit are judged by the powers that be. The long road, the men of substance, of Lucia. Power of the men is organized not in the image of Yeshua, who was poor and without power, one of Tameante, but of the administrative structure of the very Imperium Romanum, which put him to death, from the Pontifex Maximus all the way, all the way down to the Diocesis, the imperial unit of power. In this unhappy scene, as in so many others, captured iconically in the legend of the Grand Inquisitor, who stands in the place of Yeshua, who stands in the place of Yeshua? And who stands in the place of the Roman procurator? Who stands on the side of divine weakness? And who stands on the side of worldly power? What more tragic farce than the kingdom of God, than thinking the kingdom of God needs to be administered by imperial Roman rule? A church more Roman than Catholic which is tragically confused and historically contingent and conditional form of ancient political organization with the unconditional call for the coming of the kingdom is exposed for what it is by nothing less than the council principle. The year of the Jubilee has not arrived. Indeed, that is not a year that is going to have an actual date one that will go down in history as the year God's rule finally showed up and all things were made new. But if the year of the Jubilee is clearly not a matter of calendar time, what then? Well, there are two ways to deal with that challenge, the Gnostic way and the Catholic way. The Gnostic way is to say that the year of the Jubilee is a heavenly year, that it does not belong to time at all, where time is treated as an ephemeral shadow but to what the Neoplatonic philosophers thought to be the timeless one called eternity. Luke has Yeshua say that the year of the Jubilee is the pleroma, the fulfillment of time. But in the Gnostic way, fulfillment means eradication, that time and flesh will be wiped away. That is most pronounced in a very late gospel, so idiosyncratic that we often just call it the fourth gospel. There, the kingdom of God is not a form of life, but a form of afterlife. And its central narrative is a cynical story, which no one else in the New, York, in the New Testament knows, of Jesus waiting for Lazarus to die in order to put on a show of divine power by raising him from the dead. Then the kingdom of God is volatilized into a kingdom of heavenly, incorruptible, docetic bodies flitting about in a timeless eternity, doing God knows what. To such mythology, 
The best religious and theological response, as Tillich says, is atheism. The Catholic way is to remain faithful to the carnality and materiality, to the temporality and historicality of the kingdom, to mustard seeds, not metaphysics, to Yeshua, the earth man, not the heaven man. The challenge is to be faithful to this in the face of the evidence, which is that the year of the Jubilee seems very far away, indeed, farther than ever. In the Catholic way, the challenge of, God, of, of the God of Yeshua, whose icon is Yeshua, who announces good news for the poor at the coming of the Jubilee, has nothing to do with predicting the future, but with offering us a promise. The year of the Jubilee belongs neither to the timelessness of eternity, nor to the chronological time of the calendar, but to the time of a promise. The challenge is to put our trust and confidence in God's promise, a trust that is distorted when pistis becomes epistemology, a faith corrupted into modernist creedal belief, a form of life contracted into a propositional assertion. Then Protestants pound on their Bible and Pope's decree infallibly. Then the kingdom of God recedes. Then Yeshua re weeps over Jerusalem. The challenge of God comes down to this, that this primal trust is for all the world the foolishness that Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 1. Judged by the standards of the world, the genuine wisdom of God is foolishness, and the genuine power of God is weakness. In God's kingdom, offense is met with forgiveness, not retaliation, hatred, not love, uh, hatred with love, not a counterattack. Such weakness and folly are a scandal. They're a stumbling block. They are not part of a long-term winning strategy or of a case of deferred heavenly gratification or the way the weak come up with to outwit the strong and take them by surprise, which is pretty much what Nietzsche's critique of Christian resentment is. Like they are not a way to show that the ch children of the light are ultimately quicker on their feet than the children of darkness, which is a Gnostic mythology. The genuine wisdom and power of God is that the strength is found in the weakness and the wisdom in the folly of mercy, love, and forgiveness where there is every chance, maybe even a likelihood, that the wicked will prosper and the merciful will lose. As Margie Winters can tell you, the challenge of God is that God is not about winning. The kingdom of God is a form of life, not an afterlife, not a secret way to win. The year of the Jubilee is not a world historical event. It reaches such sporadic and fragile fulfillment as time allows. It is temporal, not eternal, and its temporality is neither that of calendar time nor apocalyptic time which triumphantly crushes evil. It has the temporality of the kairos, belonging to the moment, even little quotidian chirological moments, what Richard Carney calls micro-eschatologies. The kingdom of God arrives not by transcending time, by letting, but by letting the shoots of grace spring up in the crevices of time. Unhappily, the kingdom happens, grace emerges when people like Margie lose. As I have argued at greater length in the little trilogy, the weakness of God, the insistence of God, and the folly of God, the challenge of God is to recognize that the name of God is not the name of a supreme being, and supreme, nor of being itself, ipsumessa, nor of the ground of being, nor of a hyper-being, huperusia, but of a promise. The challenge of God lies not in the ontological eminence or ontological depth of being, but in the unconditionality of the challenge to make the kingdom of God come true. The operative distinctions are not ontotheological, being and beings, time and eternity, matter and spirit, body and soul, but theopoetical, conditional and unconditional, call, response. The challenge is, otherwise than being the name of a promise, of an unconditional call, of a solicitation issuing not from a super being, but from the bowels of the earth, to use an earthly image, or from the spirit in the world, to use a more edifying one. From time to time, the spirit breaks in upon us as if from without. From time to time, it breaks out among the people of God who are filled with the spirit. 
This all takes place according to the Catholic principle, the unfolding of the spirit in space and time, in carnality and mortality, in temporality and historicality, in materiality and terrestriality. I conclude with the same conclusion invoked by the authors of the op-ed in the Philadelphia newspaper. They ended by citing a line from Pope Francis. A man poised precariously and with great uneasiness between occupying the place of the Pontifex Maximus and affirming the kingdom of God. And Pope said, they could, and this is what they could. And this is my last sentence. If the Christian is a restorationist, a legalist, if he wants everything clear and safe, then he will find nothing. Tradition and memory of the past must help us have the courage to open up new areas to God. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a wonderful talk. I, I look forward very much to hearing the response as well. Uh, so let me introduce to you, without delay, uh, John McCarthy is Associate Professor of Theology here at Loyola University in Chicago. Professor McCarthy specializes in hermeneutical and fundamental theological approaches to a broad range of his interests, and has in recent years been involved in collaborative research groups studying the significance of Galileo, the notion of the sacred, the ethics of belief and interpretation, and even astrobiology soon. So, we welcome him for a response. To be sure, in this paper we have a real gift from Professor Caputo. It is, in many ways, a summary of his 2016 book, The Folly of God, A Theology of the Unconditional. But I hope that this gift is not one which means that you don't need to go out and buy the book and read it. This is not a gift of replacement, but of seduction. <laughs> the paper is a gift for other reasons. It's an instance of how a thoughtful person thinks theologically. It's an example of a theological reflection rooted in the practicality of the everyday and the flux of a living tradition. It's a catalog of some of the most frequent themes and ideas used by Professor Caputo, hope, promise, event, criticism of destructive absolutes, attention to proper names and naming, to suffering, to irony and paradox, and not least, to the name of God. It's a gift to both the mind and the heart because it does what <coughs> Professor Caputo is noted for, taking the often jargon-filled language of philosophy and theology and making its Saka its issue not only clear, but also felt and without loss of reader. So for this gift, I'm sure that those here, like I, am grateful. And as with all gifts, except maybe the divine gift, it begs to be unwrapped and it sets up an economy, a debt, a further opportunity for exchange, for enjoyment. So let's turn to enjoying the gift. There's no doubt that Professor Caputo took the theme of the conference, The Challenge of God, seriously. In a paper whose text is 20 pages, double space, the phrase, The Challenge of God, occurs 18 times. This is a testament not only to the word search capability of a word processor, but <laughs> also to Professor Caputo's response to the issue of the conference. When you look over these 18 instances, it becomes evident that the challenge of God is no one thing in this reflection. It's an opening to the future, the name of a promise. It is the icon of Yeshua. It's what puts you on the spot. It is unconditional. It's a call. It's what dispels onto theologies. It's what breaks contingencies. It's the challenge to see what you would want to avoid, like the poor or the marginalized. It's a paradoxical wisdom. It's a demand to trust this paradox. It's the theopoetical dimension of a call and response structure of human existence. And this litany challenge of God occurs in a particular hermeneutical situation where two principles, the Protestant principle of semper reformanda, simul justus et peccator, 
is always in play with the Catholic principle of historicality and temporality, materiality and carnality, a tradition always in motion. This hermeneutical location of the challenge of God takes for Professor Caputo a structure, a form, call and response, and it deals with particulars like Margie and Sister Mary in a particular situation like the controversial firing from a job, in a particular time, a time of contested family values and politically fractious atmospheres. And all this can and does and must change constantly. The only thing that remains constant, as the saying goes, is change. Back to the 18 times that the phrase occurs. 16 of those are in sentences, and two are in titles, the title of the paper and the title of a subsection. The challenge of God for Professor Caputo is both a litany and a summary phrase. And that double use raises a question for me. What is the challenge of God within Professor Caputo, Caputo's thought when it moves from litany to title to a summary phrase? Is the challenge of God the name for uncomfortable moments, particularities in life? Is it only for Christians since Yeshua is the icon and Paul is its example? Is it another symbolic name for authentic existence? Is it the universal name for all existence? Maybe this is Hegel's question. Is the challenge of God the aesthetic form of something else? Hence, a turn to the theopoetics. I know that this Hegelian reading is not what Professor Caputo wants, but wow, spirit occurs 45 times, and it works in history a lot. With a reason, <laughs> just a really inverted one called foolishness. Just a really inverted reason called foolishness. <laughs> Deconstruction as a practice is always aware of textual fissures, the proverbial Freudian slip turned difference. Maybe it's deconstruction, maybe it's just correcting a lot of undergraduate papers. But there's a spelling mistake on page 20 that would miss the ear of an audience but hit the eye of a reader. The sentence reads as follows, quote, this all takes place according to the Catholic principle, the unfolding of the spirit in space and time, in carnality and mortality, in temporality and historicality, immateriality and terrestriality. Now, it should read, I suspect, in materiality and not immateriality. Immateriality is what Professor Caputo does not want. <laughs> A metaphysics of matter and spirit, he calls it elsewhere. But does it still lurk here, almost in the slip, in the use of this language that always walks a tightrope between immateriality and immateriality when talking about spirit? And another sentence makes me wonder. It reads, quote, the challenge is otherwise than being, the name of a promise, of an unconditional call, of a solicitation issuing not from a super being, but from the bowels of the earth to use an earthly image, or from spirit in the world to use a more edifying one. Is the bowels of the earth to the spirit of the world exchange a mark of a rhetoric of edification alone? Why should we be more edified by spirit in the world language than bowels of the earth language, especially if the Catholic principle is a carnal one? Carnal. Carnal, yes. Carnal. <laughs> Maybe I'm just a bowels kind of guy. <laughs> I've been called worse. <laughs> but it seems to me that this spirit language has other dimensions to it than that of edification. In other words, Professor Caputo is careful to distinguish between God and the name of God. The name of God does not entail or refer or need a God. It needs a language, and it has an effect on this language. And this language has an effect on speakers and actors of this language, more than an effect. It is the atmosphere, the home, food and water of these speakers and actors, 
But here in this paper, Professor Caputo does not use the frame, phrase, the name of the spirit. It is spirit in the world, moving, unfolding, prompting, stirring, indeed challenging, back to the conference title, The Challenge of God. And so where do I go with this edifying spirit talk? Let me go to one more sentence just to see if this helps. Professor Caputo writes, quote, instead of describing a fact of the matter or predicting the future course of events, Yeshua was offering us hope, making us a promise, and that is what God means, which means this what God means to do. There's a verb dropped here, is, this is what God means to do, in the last phrase, again, easily missed by the ear, but obvious to sight. And it would be helpful to probe this fissure if we had time. But what I want to call attention to is this little snippet. Yeshua was offering us hope, making us a promise. It seems like we're supposed to read this as a kind of Yeshua speech act. Promise made, call issue, response should come, spirit moving, unfolding, prompting, stirring, challenging. But we can also read this as making us a promise. We are the promise issued to ourselves. We are made into promise by the name of God. We are this spirit. We are the ones who call for our own response. In short, we hope because we must be our own promise when we introduce the name of God into the mix. And all this spirit and promise talk and the challenge of God as a summary phrase is about us as our own promise, our own hope, our own responsibility. We need to do more with Margie than see her as an event of a spirit in breaking with a paradoxical wisdom. Messiahs, eschatologies, micro or macro, events, impossibles, Yes, this may be edifying, and perhaps more than this, but it seems too easy to turn the challenge of Margie and Sister Mary into a theology of consolation, named wisdom as foolishness, by a theopoetics of spirit and promise. And I don't think that Professor Caputo wants this at all. Carnal, carnality, appears seven times. Not much of a match for a spirit that appears 45 times, but it's not a bad show. <laughs> but in the particulars of the disasters, the suffering, in the face of invincible ignorance or sincere but uncritical faith, is this really the theology, quote, the right theological argument to make, as Professor Caputo writes at the beginning of his, his paper, when we probe the challenge of God and the Catholic principle? I'm wondering if, in our particularities, we might need much, a much more robust anthropoetics. 